Today we're gonna to talk about a big macro concept and we're really gonna get into the weeds so it's gonna be interesting. And this concept is the relationship between stocks and bonds. And that probably sounds pretty simple and sometimes it can be, but the big thing that's happening now is that relationship is changing. And that's because we're moving into a very different macro environment than the one we've been in for the past four years. And because of that, the relationships between these assets are gonna change a lot. And this information is not only important to macro nerds like most of us on this channel, but also any anyone who has a standard portfolio and that's everyone right and what is a standard portfolio other than the 60 40 equities to bonds split that's the classic advice put 60 percent of your money in stocks and 40 percent in bonds and then you'll be balanced but as we move through different macro environments obviously that's going to change so let's take a look at exactly how that's going to change and to start off let's look at some stats from ben carlson who's really my go-to guy now for stats but he had a post recently talking about if 60 40 was really dead and and yeah, this isn't a new topic. He puts some headlines here from 2012 to 2017 every year. We're saying, oh, 6040 is finally dead. And this year feels even worse because returns have been pretty bad. The 6040 mix of stocks and bonds is down around 11% this year. And the worst part is that bonds are down double digits just like the stock market. And we're gonna explain this in more detail in a second, but we know that the bond market and the stock market are supposed to balance each other. When one's going down, the other should be going up. That's not happening too well this year. Like Ben said here, both stocks and bonds are down so the total portfolio is down a lot too so there have been a number of white papers released around this topic recently because things are changing and this one from alliance bernstein basically says that stocks and bonds were a wonderful counterbalance for each other in a disinflationary environment and that's where interest rates are falling obviously and that environment is basically from the 80s until now but the issue is that maybe that relationship isn't going to hold under different macro conditions so the falling interest rate and inflation rate regime we've been in since the early 1980s, that's been great for financial assets. From 1982 through the end of 2021, a 60-40 mix of stocks and bonds rebalanced annually returned 10.8% annually. That's a fantastic return, right? It's actually very close to the 12.2% annual return in US stocks over that same time. But because it's a 60-40 mix, only 60% were in stocks and 40% in bonds, you have a lot less volatility in that portfolio. In fact, one third less volatility. And if you take that into account, you really really have seen one of the most extraordinary runs ever for a stock bond portfolio. And that's especially true when you look at US treasuries. They were up almost 7.5% per year over this 40 year period. When are we ever gonna see returns like that again in bonds? Maybe never. So the 80s until now, what have we had? We've had interest rates continuously falling, right? and inflation not being there. We've been in a disinflationary environment. But if we go back to before the 80s, if we look from the 1940s to the 1980s, that's a different environment. In that period, interest rates actually rose and inflation was higher than average and rising. And bonds performed poorly, or at least relative to the period we just experienced. So you could see the two periods here side by side with stock returns, bond returns. Bonds returned a lot less from the 40s to the 80s than they did in the previous period. Also, inflation was very different. Inflation was double during that period. But all in all, look at the total portfolio's returns. From the 40s to the 80s, it was 8%. And then from the 80s to the 2020s, 10.8%. So if we're thinking that stocks and bonds are gonna act completely different in this new inflationary environment that we're going into, that may be true, but also maybe there's not that much of a difference. Sure, 3% is a solid difference, but still not as much as we would imagine. Now, of course, real returns were much worse in this 40s to 80s period because inflation was 2% higher per year, but a diversified portfolio portfolio still returned 3.3% above the rate of inflation for four decades. That's not bad. And what's interesting in that time from the 40s through the 80s, or I should say 70s, it ended in the early 80s, it was very volatile. So you can see here inflation is jumping all over the place. It wasn't steady at all. You had yields jumping all over the place, stocks and bonds too, their returns were changing. So you had some good decades and some bad decades. Some had high inflation, some low some low yields and some high yields. So it was way more volatile, but it seemed to work out okay, considering the difference in returns right here. Now, if we're moving into an extended period of time of higher inflation now, from the 2020s onward, then most likely we're gonna get more economic and stock market volatility, all else equal. In a relative sense, the last 40 years in the market have been very calm, but it looks like those that have a healthy dose of stocks and bonds might be okay. So it might not be safe to assume that investors are gonna get absolutely screwed in this environment of higher rates, higher inflation, and more macro volatility. The past has shown that financial assets can still provide respectable returns even when the economy isn't ideal. So 
that's the data side of it. But now what we want to do is really understand why it's so different. How does inflation playing into making the next 40 years so different from what we've just experienced? Well, for that, we'll go over to our research at Makarovs. And this is something we just talked about recently. It's called Big Balance Sheet Economics. And it explains what's going on with this regime change. And you guys all know we're always tracking the stock and bond relationship at Makarovs. Because at their core, markets are a game of relativity. Most investors want to maximize potential returns while capping their downside risk, obviously. And we say most because there actually are also price blind buyers who for regulatory or structural reasons need to hold certain assets such as treasuries. And these are like your big pension funds and sovereign wealth funds, things like that. And they do create significant demand. We made a video a long time ago about uh, Ray Dalio's demand model. And when he looks at the stock market, he separates all these different groups of buyers and sellers, including these institutional guys that are held by their regulations. So they have to be buyers that really change the supply demand dynamics. But anyway, most investors attempt to meet their investment goals by investing across a universe of assets that run from the safest and least volatile with the lowest expected returns, you could say like bonds, to the riskier, more volatile and higher returning assets. So you could say stocks, but you know, it's actually a really widespread all the way from cash to sovereign bonds, to credit, to equities, to even crypto and NFTs. That's uh, least risky to most risky. And from a practical perspective, stocks and bonds compete for capital. Higher yields on bonds attract money, which puts the pinch on stocks. Because think about it, if bond prices are falling, what happens to the interest rate and the yields? They go up, right? So when that happens, investors are always looking at what kind of return they're going to get from stocks compared to what kind of return they're going to get from bonds. So if that interest rate is going up on bonds, they see a better return over here, they're going to sell their stocks and go into bonds. But then what happens once they start buying up bonds? The price of bonds go up, right? And if bond prices go up, then interest rates fall again. So once again, those bonds become less attractive because they have a lower yield. And then these same investors pile into stocks again and push those up. And the process keeps repeating and money keeps flowing back and forth. And that's how they balance each other. And one of the points we're making in this video is that that balancing act has not been working well this last year. And that's because of a difference between the inflationary environment and a disinflationary environment. But anyway, higher yields attract flows, which then put the pinch on stocks. Then stocks sell off, bonds get bid, and the yields fall again, like we just said, and capital eventually flows back to stocks until bonds sell off to the point where bonds once again become more attractive and then the process repeats again and again so it's all relative now over the last 20 years bonds have provided increasing amounts of negative downside capture now what is that well basically the more negative the downside capture the more bonds returned while stocks fell so here's the downside capture this is bonds versus stocks. You can see in the 2000s and the 10s, we have very large negative downside capture, meaning bonds returned a lot while stocks were falling. And this is why risk parity funds have performed so well over the last few decades, because they've used a lot of leverage to exploit this relationship. And the risk parity funds, they try to balance everything perfectly and use leverage to do that. Like Dalio's all weather fund, that's a risk parity fund. And his edge was that he understood macro so well that he knew relationships no one else knew between different asset classes. So he would invest in each class for the long term, use different amounts of leverage, so that each year he was making money, even as the stock market crashed or bonds were doing this or commodities were doing something else. He had it all balanced risk parity. That's why it's called that. So for a long time, this relationship between bonds and stocks was a good one to exploit. And the reason why is because of the leverage in the financial and economic system. So this is where we get into the big balance sheet economics. So the relationship between bonds and stocks have been changing, right? That's what we've been talking about in this whole video. Well, that's because of the evolution of private sector balance sheets. So we're talking about the balance sheet of companies, right? So when balance sheets are small relative to GDP, their influence on the economy through wealth effects and the refinancing of debt is subdued, which makes sense, right? They're not such a big part of the economy. But when private sector balance sheets are bloated, they heavily influence the business cycle. So one of the implications of this BBSE, which is the big balance sheet economics, is that stock market declines have a greater potential to trigger recessions and destabilizing debt dynamics. And treasury bonds tend to rally sharply when these equities turn down. And that downside capture ratio that we were talking about, it was the most negative in the 20s and the 10s. Both of those were periods where the private sector balance sheets were large relative to incomes. And another thing that affects this whole relationship is inflation dynamics. During periods where we've had overinflated private sector balance sheets, those companies have been at overcapacity. They keep producing, right? And when they are producing so much supply, that exerts secular deflationary pressures. Because what do we know? If there's too much supply, 
supply and the same amount of demand prices fall. And we get too much supply when these private companies have those big balance sheets. So that's how inflation and the balance sheets are related. Now let's look at the same inflation with the stock bond relationship. So when deflationary pressures are absent, as was the case from 1934 to 2000, the stock market and bond yields are negatively correlated. But when inflationary pressures are present, meaning we do have inflation, bond yields would go up and the actual and potential Fed rate hikes would cause stocks to decline. So that's what's happening now, right? Stocks keep falling because we expect the Fed to hike and yields are naturally going up as well. But when we're in a period of deflation, as was the case since 2000, and by the way, this paper was written in 20. 19, the one we're referring to in this research. So things just change because inflation is back. But when we're in deflation, rising inflation actually just reflects an improving economy but it's not being met with aggressive Fed rate hikes. So that's why in a deflationary environment, stocks can continue to rally when bond yields rise because the market doesn't think the Fed is gonna hike rates. And again, the whole point of talking about those private company balance sheets is because when they're bloated, we're getting disinflation from their overcapacity. When they're not bloated, we might get more inflation because they're not giving that overcapacity. That's another way to look at it. But in an inflationary environment, everyone's afraid of the Fed hiking rates because they are hiking rates and that's when you're going to see everything fall. And again, this paper was written in 2019, so a lot has changed. But high inflation, like what we're experiencing now, is why bonds have not been providing the negative downside capture that they have in the past. Again, because look at this. This is great negative downside capture. So when stocks are falling, bonds are returning good returns. But that's not happening anymore. And that's once again because of high inflation. And I told you we were getting into the macro weeds, right? So if you really want to understand why this is happening, this is why it's happening. So time will tell whether this is a transitory development and BBSC dynamics drive inflation back down to trend, meaning we get bloated balance sheets again and oversupply, or if we're truly in a new secular regime. Now let's get a little more practical. How do we use all this? Well, at MacroOps, we look at yields as an input for checking the general risk on risk off environment. And what we're concerned with is the actual trend and rate of change, not so much the absolute levels. We want to see how much it's increasing or how much it's decreasing the rate of change. So the delta. So if you look at our liquidity page, if you're a collective member, you could see these charts. We have a nice little dashboard set up, but basically liquidity is poor. And this has been a liquidity driven bear market to date. The rate of change on yields is historically high too. You could see these green lines right here, right? They're rising and they are indeed hitting historical highs and that is not good for risk assets. So we need this delta on yields, which is how fast they're changing. We need that to fall in order for us to become more constructive in this market. So looking at how those yields change gives us an idea of where to position in the market. And a simple way to look at how it's working is just look at the US 10 year bond and the S&P. So you can see every time the bonds rally, stocks follow, but bonds end up quickly turning around again and bonds are this white line and stocks are the orange line. And as soon as bonds turn around again, stocks can't keep their rally and they fall too. It happened right here. You see this white line spiking and then the stock market following after, then the white line following the market following as well. Again here, bonds spike, stock spike, but then bonds can't keep the bid. So now we're checking what's going to happen this time as well. But what we really need is for yields to stop changing so fast and to peak. If that happens, then we'll get a more stable bottom in the market for at least a multi-week to multi-month rally. Doesn't mean the bear market is over, but if you're trading, that's what you're looking for. Now, if you want to learn more about this topic, check out this video right here. That video is from this same report where we talk about how we might not actually have a bad recession from all of this. It could very well be overblown even with this new inflationary environment. So click this video right here and I will see you there.